Versailles, palace of Louis XIV, the Sun King. Here Louis wanted a paradise, a place of exquisite beauty cut off from the problems of the world. And he got it. At Versailles, France's handsome creative monarch produced a dazzling array of immaculate gardens, classically designed palaces. In such a paradise that delighted the senses, no one heard the approaching thunder of revolution. It is written. This is George Madden presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. Today from the Empires in Collision series, back to the garden. No expense was spared to make the gardens at Versailles the most splendid in the world. Such a quantity and variety of flowers filled these gardens that guests were sometimes overwhelmed by the sight and the smell. Sometimes they would pass through banks of exotic blossoms on their way to supper, and then as they returned to the gardens after the meal, find to their amazement that the beds and the borders were now filled with masses of entirely different flowers. Louis loved fountains. He had a total of 1,400 of them built on the palace grounds, and he wanted them constantly in play. This was impossible, of course, from an engineering point of view at that time. There just wasn't enough water pressure. So when His Majesty took strolls around the garden, his servants had to frantically manipulate the taps so that the right fountain came on as soon as the king came by in sight of it was turned off to conserve the water supply as soon as he passed it by. Life at Versailles established an ideal of sorts. The object of the game was pleasure of the most extravagant and expensive kind. Operas and plays were sometimes commissioned and performed just for the entertainment of the many guests. A duchess observed that gambling was enthusiastically pursued. The players behave like madmen, she declared, screaming, striking the table, uttering blasphemous oaths. And there's always a feast going on. Louis loved to eat. A lady at the court declared that if she had eaten half as much as Louis, she'd be dead within a week. Louis also consorted with a succession of mistresses. There was always some kind of sexual maneuvering going on at court. And although Louis detested it, Homosexuality was rife among the courtiers at Versailles. One observer concluded that these social climbers had become bored with the easy charms of the women at the palace. Life at Versailles seemed safely insulated within its well-financed pleasures. But here, in the narrow streets of Paris, only a dozen miles from Versailles, there were no gardens or parties or elaborate costumes, just an endless struggle for daily bread. Lives walled in by poverty proceeded from desperation to despair to smoldering anger. Bold new ideas about freedom and equality aroused the masses, and the people began to feel a revolution rumbling in their empty bellies. It was a rumbling Louis XIV couldn't understand. Those closest to the king had concluded it was no use speaking to him about the miserable conditions under which most of his subjects lived. It merely made him cross. Louis' successors did little to reach beyond their paradise at Versailles. And so the smoldering anger turned into shouts of rage. On October 5, 1789, the women of Paris, having formed their own regiments, marched on Versailles. They were armed and they were angry. In pouring rain, the mobs swarmed around the gates, shouting threats. The fishwives and market women had had enough. No more talking. They yelled, bread, bread, bread. Meat at six sous the pound. The paradise at Versailles had come to an end. The revolution had come in earnest. The palace was ransacked. The royal family became refugees. The golden age of Versailles passed away. 
but something of its spirit still remained. Even after the revolution, that promise of a material paradise persisted. In Europe, the struggle to acquire creature comforts slowly began to replace the comforts of religion. A break with spiritual values was forming that would soon create a more secular world. And then another kind of revolution arrived, the Industrial Revolution. For a time, that material paradise seemed within reach. We were confident the machine could save us and usher in a new age. Gustave Eiffel, an engineer specializing in viaducts and pylons, decided that a tall tower would be just the thing to set off the Paris World Exhibition of 1889. It was a way to demonstrate what man could accomplish with his new industrial muscle. He was a symbol of technological progress, a gravity-defying structure gracefully throwing its iron latticework 1,056 feet into the sky. It lifted up to the heavens a celebration of architectural and engineering skill. In factories around Europe, machines were doing more in much less time than human laborers could ever hope to do. The world's leaders were looking forward, you see, to endless financial expansion via the Industrial Revolution. The end of the 19th century really was an age of optimism. Man was on a material ascent, an ascent that seemed as grand as the Eiffel Tower on which I'm standing at the moment. From the peak of his technological progress, he looked out on the world as master. Progress was the watchword of the day. People saw before them a limitless horizon, and increasingly they did not find God on their horizon. Darwin's theory of evolution and higher criticism had cast doubt on God's word. It seemed more reasonable to place faith in man and progress than in spiritual truth. But then suddenly, that optimistic age came crashing to a halt in a worldwide reign of terror. World War I. The machines that were supposed to save mankind could now be used equally as well to destroy him. Tanks and artillery multiplied the carnage of the battlefield. And the factory system in our cities produced its own kind of grinding poverty. The worker was locked into long hours of drudgery in an unhealthy environment. He usually went home to a tenement crowded into the slums. The poor remained. The material paradise always lay somewhere just ahead over the horizon, beckoning them on, enabling them to toil just one more day. And so we've landed in a deeply secular age, founded on a belief that we can solve our problems without God. Driving the age forward is always the vision of a material paradise. Today, that old problem, the gap between the haves and the have-nots, has not gone away. By some accounts, it's even been magnified in spite of all of our industrial resources. I believe it's time we looked at an alternative. We've been pursuing the material paradise for so long that sometimes we forget there is something else to aim at on the horizon. The alternative is the kingdom of Christ. It stands in stark contrast to most of our preoccupations today. In Christ's kingdom, success is measured by such things as meekness and mercy. The poor in spirit are respected, not shoved aside. It's those who seek God from a pure heart, not those who seek status symbols, who are considered most fortunate. And those who pursue righteousness and peace are blessed, not those who are in pursuit of a penthouse apartment especially. Christ has built his empire on this earth based on these principles, and soon it will come into violent collision with another empire in hot pursuit of a material paradise, the empire of Satan himself. You see, sometimes the devil attacks with banners blazing to demonic activity. Sometimes he makes a frontal assault by means of some persecuting atheistic regime. But often, he's content to seduce us into a pleasant slumber surrounded by material comforts, insulated from God. 
He's quite happy to remain in the background as long as we remain in his empire of self-satisfied materialism. Yes, the battle lines are being drawn right now between the empire of Satan and the empire of Christ. And the book of Revelation describes that coming conflict. And it suggests that we fix our aim on the right paradise by going back to our roots. By the way, there's so much more I'd like to share with you about this final conflict that will affect us all. So we prepared a miniseries book, Empires in Collision, Your Survival Guide. It's yours for the asking at the close of our telecast. So please remember to ask for your copy in just a few moments. But now back to finding our roots in the book of Revelation. In the 14th chapter, three angels are pictured flying over the earth, giving man his last message before the final conflict. And this is what the first angel declares with a loud voice. Let's go back here to the 14th chapter and verse 7. Hear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Here we are reminded to worship God as creator, the maker of our material world. Our secular age has forgotten this important fact. We must trace our origin to the spiritual being. Our roots are in him. We do not go back simply to an accidental mingling of chemical material. No. The second angel in Revelation 14 announces that Babylon has fallen. In ancient times, Babylon was a very rich, indulgent city that often troubled Jerusalem and dominated it. In the Hebrew mind, it suggested a materialistic and immoral way of life. And so Babylon came to symbolize the realm of Satan with all its seductive allure. Well, the second angel was announcing that the empire of materialism is doomed going to run into dead ends. Its promise of paradise is an illusion. And then the third angel speaks in verse 9. He delivers a very strong warning about worshiping the beast and his image. The beast was a symbol of Satan's representative on earth, the head of his vast alternate empire. And I believe the material paradise is part of that counterfeit system. Now, in very forceful terms, the third angel warns us about the fate waiting those who give their allegiance to the beast. He says in verses 9 and 10 of the 14th chapter, If anyone worships the beast at his image, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury. Notice here that we see the counterpoint to the first angel's message. We're not to worship the beast. We are to worship the creator. These two stand in opposition. The one calls us into Satan's empire, into his seductive vision of a material paradise. The other one calls us to give God glory, to worship him as creator. We need to get back past the secular age and find our spiritual roots. Now let me tell you one way in which we can do this. It's something that many Christians have overlooked. The fourth commandment that God delivered to his people from Mount Sinai actually called them back to their origins to their roots, their spiritual roots. It said this, Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. Now notice, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The fourth commandment asks us to remember. Remember the one who made the heavens and the earth. It's a weekly reminder of the day on which God finished his creation. This is a wonderful thing to have in our secular age, a, a tie in time back to our origins. You see, we can look to the sun for our yearly cycle. We can look to the moon for our monthly cycle. But there's no natural phenomenon to explain our weekly cycle. It is suspended alone in time, pointing back to the seven literal days of creation, back to the seventh day when God rested from his works and made something holy. The Sabbath declares to a secular age rooted in materialism, stop, 
Our roots go back to something else. We are tied to a creator. We're not just material specks in a mechanical universe. We're spiritual beings with the ability to worship God Almighty. Now, there's another way in which the Sabbath functions as God's alternative to Satan's materialistic empire. It asks us to stop working. It ordains a break in that endless struggle for daily bread. Listen to this clear declaration in the book of Hebrews, the New Testament book, chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Do God's people still need a Sabbath rest? Yes, now more than ever. The Sabbath gives us a chance to look up out of our rut. It gives us time to reach out toward that Creator who is still able to supply the needs of His creatures. The Sabbath reminds us we're all children of a God who cares. We're so busy trying to ensure material security, we don't have time to look up to the source of eternal security. But He does supply the needs of those who trust Him. Knowing the Creator and taking time to worship Him does make a difference. The Sabbath is a wonderful answer for those caught up in the false promises of the material paradise. It can be our oasis in a spiritually barren world which glorifies material success. It can be our fertile garden where spiritual values blossom and bear good fruit. It's tragic that all of this beauty here at Versailles was surrounded by such corruption. King Louis XIV did build something very worthwhile here. It is a masterpiece. It's inspiring on the outside, that is. These gardens have given enjoyment to millions, but inside those walls, human nature indulged itself to death. I believe that God calls us back to another beautiful garden so much more magnificent than this one here in Versailles. Back to the original garden, the original paradise which he created perfect, the paradise which the Sabbath memorializes. God spared no expense. He worked to make it the, mo make it the most beautiful in the world. And there he wanted to have fellowship with us. That's what Christ's empire calls us back to, back to the garden, back to our spiritual roots with our Creator. Oh, please don't let anything muffle that call. Don't let materialism dull your spiritual senses. Don't become deaf to the Spirit, because you won't be able to hear the far-off rumblings of revolution coming closer. Insulated in comforts, you may fall asleep. There won't be just an angry mob that interrupts your slumber. It'll be God coming to earth to make it new, coming to reckon once and for all with the beast and his evil empire. Make sure you don't fall for Satan's counterfeit vision. Make sure you remember the creator of heaven and earth and worship him alone. Take the wonderful gift of Sabbath rest. Take time to remember, time to worship. Take time now before the clash of empires makes it too late. Then you'll see clearly, you'll grasp even more firmly that there's room at the cross for you. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide and it's great so free is sufficient for me and deep is its fountain as wide as the sea there's room at the cross for you there's room at the cross for you Oh.
and the love of my Savior is long. Through sunshine or rain, through loss or in gain, the blood flows from Calvary to cleanse every stain. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. God is calling us today back to his garden, calling us to remember anew that he's still our creator, calling us to remember to spend that sacred weekly time with him on his holy day. I hope you'll spend some time this week reflecting on God as your creator. I know I will. Even over here in the busy streets of Los Angeles, I see evidence every day, every hour of his creative power in nature, the lives of men and women the world over. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of God. when faith becomes law. Could a gentle nation like the United States ever enforce the morality of the majority? Don't miss The Lamb That Roars. 